The Atheist Debate Patreon Project presents a partial debate review for Matt Dullhoney and Mike Winger. Is belief in the resurrection reasonable? And of course I just realized that reading that off, uh, the debate may have been is the resurrection reasonable or is it unreasonable or is it unreasonable to believe. Doesn't really matter that much because the purpose of the debate wasn't just did the resurrection happen, it was is it reasonable to believe that the resurrection happened? Or is it unreasonable? Depending on how you want to frame things. In either way, in either case, I'm convinced that it is unreasonable to believe that the resurrection occurred. The resurrection of Jesus is reported in the Gospels. Now, I'm not going to be doing a full debate review on this today. I want to be able to go back and think about it for a while and watch, but I, there were certain things I wanted to pick out. Uh, mistakes were made on, on both sides. Uh, I, I allowed myself to get a little riled up at one point uh, because while the subject of the debate is all about epistemology, it's all about standards of evidence, it is Mike attempting to show that his standards of evidence are good enough and under those standards of evidence, you are then reasonable in accepting that the resurrection happened. And it's about me showing a standard of evidence that precludes the resurrection and why that is superior. That's what, the, that's what the debate should have been about. And so when Mike presents his case and he covers all this ground, uh, there are a couple things in there I'm going to address today. Uh, but at some one point, he... He conflated two different things, and I know I explained this in the debate, but I was, like I said, legitimately a little riled up because it was an assertion that is absolutely the opposite of who I am and what I was advocating for. And it was frustrating to be sitting there explaining about standards of evidence and then just be told, oh, it's vague. And Matt has said that uh, he doesn't know what would change his mind, and that's the equivalent of saying nothing would change his mind. No, those two things aren't equivalent. Just like saying, uh, I don't know what would convince me of something is not the same as saying nothing can convince me of something. The fact that I'm not aware of the exact nature, quality, and quantity of evidence that would be sufficient is an exercise in humility. It's an exercise in recognizing that I may not have the relevant expertise to even figure out what it, what it would be that, that would convince me or that should convince me, uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm not open to being convinced. And the, the truth is, I'm convinced about a great many things. I'm willing to take people at their word for some things. The other thing that he said that, that kind of piggybacked off of this was that uh, evidence doesn't matter to Matt. That's just not true. Evidence is the primary concern. When a claim has sufficient evidence for it, that would convince me. That's it. Now, the whole foundation and discussions about epistemology is about figuring out how much evidence that is, both quality and quantity, uh, and where we should draw the lines. And my view is that I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. And so I have my standards of evidence such that it's very difficult for things to get in there because I'd rather not be deceived. And this isn't about whether or not somebody's intentionally trying to deceive me, although that does happen. Uh, it's about making sure that I'm not wrong because as soon as I commit to a belief in something or an acceptance of something as real, that fundamentally changes my view of reality. It becomes a part of it. Beliefs don't live in a vacuum. And so when he accused me of not caring about evidence, uh, it was, I think there was a partial confusion because I'm very, I try to be very precise with my language, especially when we're having to, debates and discussions like this, where it's pointing out there is no contemporary evidence. I was not saying anecdotal evidence, testimonial evidence isn't evidence. Of course it's evidence. It's just that it, it's never going to be sufficient uh, on its own without physical evidence supporting it to establish extraordinary claims. The, the fact that people, you know, you could have everyone on the planet testify that they saw somebody rise from the dead and that may not be enough to convince you that it happened. I would argue that that would probably convince me that it happened or that all of these people experienced something that they're describing that way. But as I pointed out in the debate, that's completely separate from whether or not we have an explanation for why it happened. Now, to be fair, the subject of the debate was not, it is unreasonable to believe that the resurrection is supernatural. Uh, that would have been even easier because, you know, I could just concede the resurrection happened. Uh, I don't. But then we would still have all our work in front of us to prove exactly how it happened. And this is, you know, I've mentioned Arthur C. Clarke in the debate that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguish indistinguishable from magic. Uh, that's part of it. 
But there's one key thing that happened in the debate that I wanted to address. Um, I think it happens at about the hour and 27 mark, give or take, uh, because this is something that I couldn't have planned and hadn't anticipated. I, if I'm recalling correctly, we'd already had a quick back and forth about a video uh, about a, that sh purported to show a resurrection. And um, Mike's response was, well, when the video starts, the guy's already breathing. And I agree, that's one of the first things I noticed. But I also noticed that the video starts after the resurrection process has already happened. And he, when I pointed that out, rightly pointed out, well, that's a great little ad hoc explanation. Uh, you're right that that is an ad hoc explanation that I can't prove and you can't disprove, but I can make a reasonable case for it. Because if you look at the video, there's a coffin and there's a guy laying it and there are people standing all around. And these people have, you know, it took a while to gather the crowd. I don't know what they were able to examine or not examine, but the video starts after the, the, the resurrection process has begun. And if I'm standing there and I see a guy in a coffin and this guy starts praying over him and saying stuff and I notice he starts breathing, that's when I'm going to grab my phone and hold it up and start recording it. So I'm going to get it after he starts breathing, but it still doesn't change whether or not there was a resurrection. And to all the people gathered around there, I can't interview them currently. Uh, I don't know who they are, but at least they're alive now and it would be possible for somebody to go investigate and ask questions and hopefully ask the right questions to let us know whether or not what they saw um, is reasonable to accept. W was this just a con? And the, the reason I raised that issue is because Mike is accepting a resurrection based on less evidence. Reports of reports, there's no, there's no eyewitness accounts. I mean, even the things when he listed, he's like, you know, when he goes through Acts where Paul was talking about, you know, first he appeared to Mary Magdalene, then to the 12, and then to the 500, and then to James, and then lastly to me. Uh, and I may have missed somebody or skipped somebody in there, but from memory, that's good enough. The truth is, as I noted during the debate, that's Paul making all of those claims. We don't have anything from the 500 or from James or from Mary Magdalene or from the disciples. We have reports about all that that are second and third hand, but in this case, it's all Paul. Well, how reliable is Paul? The Damascus Road experience that he had uh, is something that has been written off by some people as if it's a schizoid break or a psychotic episode or a delusion or whatever else, uh, especially since the description, his, his description uh, is that uh, he was blinded and he heard a voice, but the men who were with him saw nothing. Um, whether or not they heard something. The problem is, is that this makes Paul at least a questionable witness. It makes his testimony about this questionable. You have to begin by assuming that Paul had a real encounter with the risen Christ before you can take his word on the other things. And that's what makes that, ult that argument ultimately circular. But the incident that happened, I think it's at one hour and 27 minutes uh, that I couldn't have planned for was when Mike inadvertently demonstrated that my standards of evidence were vastly superior to what he was willing to accept. And I'm going to go through the example paraphrasing really quickly um, because it's important, because this is the crux of how and why I set my standards of evidence where they are. I said he was asking about extraordinary claims and extraordinary evidence and he got it wrong that it would be circular. He didn't understand that when you present extraordinary evidence, it's not that the evidence is extraordinary. It's that the evidence is sufficient to warrant acceptance of the extraordinary. That it, the evidence is sufficient to the claim, not that it's a new claim itself. And so I mentioned, if I claimed that I had a winning lottery ticket, that's an extraordinary claim. Despite the fact that it happens fairly frequently, people win the lottery from time to time, it's still an extraordinary claim that any single individual says, boom, I have a lottery ticket and it's the winning numbers. Now, I was pointing out that the extraordinary evidence that would show that this is the case is turning that lottery ticket in and getting paid. Because that, that is, that, that's what happens. I mean, it, it happens all the time to the people who win, but that is exactly the level of evidence that we, we would need to show that this claim is actually true. Mike's reply was, well, why couldn't you just hand me the ticket and I could compare it to the numbers myself? And this, was his entire undoing on the grounds of epistemology. And to his credit, when I explained it, he recognized it. 
Curiously, he doesn't seem to recognize that it's this disparity in foundational epistemology that makes his acceptance of the resurrection unreasonable and my rejection of it the only reasonable position. Uh, which, when I say rejection, I don't mean this did not happen. It means I do not accept that this happens. There's a difference. Because when he asked if I could just hand him the ticket and he could check the number, I pointed out that magicians do this trick all the time, where the audience member call out random numbers and he shows that he's predicted those numbers and has them printed on a lottery ticket. Uh, other magicians have been able to produce the winning lottery numbers in ways that seem impossible. Some of them have used technology of some sort to achieve this. There are many other means and methods by which someone could engage in that kind of trickery. And this is actually a scam. And the scam is done in a fairly smart way, where it's not like I have a lottery ticket that has all of the winning numbers, because that's an incredibly extraordinary claim. But if I have a lottery ticket that has four of the six numbers, and that's worth, let's say, 500 bucks. I don't know how much it's worth, but we'll say it's worth 500 bucks. I can show somebody, I have this ticket, there's the winning numbers, you can see that four of them match and the payout for four is 500. For reasons I'd rather not go into, I'm in a bit of legal trouble, I don't have an ID, um, I'm wanted for, you know, a crime, don't worry, I'm not a terrible person, but I, I, you know, if I go to turn this ticket in, I'll end up getting arrested and I'll end up spending more than the 500 just on bail. And so, I paid a dollar for this ticket, I'll sell it to you for 50, then I'll get 50 to one for my money, and you'll get 10 to one on yours because you'll take your 50, buy the ticket, and then you go sell it for 500 bucks. This is a legitimate scam done in a number of different ways. I'm not saying that this is the one and only way to do this because that's also how they get you by convincing that there's only one way this can happen. But what it means is the standard of evidence that he was intuitively led to about what would show that this ticket is real was flawed, horribly flawed, to the point where he could actually have been scammed off this. Now, I will point out that we didn't talk about, hey, I'd like to sell you this ticket. That's an important thing. How convinced are you? Are you convinced enough that you'd be willing to buy this ticket? People are all the time. But the point is that the standard of evidence that would be required to show that I had a winning ticket is for me to actually cash that ticket in to the, to the authorities and be paid for that. Now, I don't think that after having that explained, there would be too many people who would say, well, Matt, your standards of evidence for lottery tickets are just too darn high. Just like we talked about last month, you're too skeptical. I don't think anybody would say that once they understood the scam, the way this can be manipulated, and what they should have to do to make sure that they're not getting scammed, to make sure that they're not believing something without good evidence. When it comes to lottery tickets, the thing that's disconcerting to me is that all of those people who would recognize that problem, who still think that anonymous reports, anonymous books that are copies of copies of translations of copies of second and third hand accounts that we can't verify, we can't investigate, are not only sufficient to warrant acceptance that something likely happened, but in this case, one of the single most important events if it were to have happened, that fundamentally changes how they live their life, how they view others, how they vote. Because Mike had an experience when he was younger where he came to believe that God exists. And this bias colors his perception of all the evidence. I had to overcome this bias because I believed as well for decades. And it wasn't until I realized that the reasons that I gave for believing were fundamentally flawed and I was open to actually accepting that, that I was able to change my mind. Epistemology, the study of how we know what we know, or better yet, standards of evidence, the thing that we're constantly talking about within skepticism and critical thinking, may be a far more important subject than the actual facts about a resurrection or the testimonial claims, etc., about a resurrection, because they get to the heart of everything. And when your standards of evidence are done reasonably, where you proportion the amount of evidence and the quality and quantity of evidence that you need before you accept this claim, that's how you avoid getting scammed in a lottery ticket scam. That's how you avoid getting scammed in any number of con artist hustles. And it's how you make sure that you're not being scammed just by stories about a religion. 
And the intuitive response from many religious people when I say something like that is, well, the lottery ticket scam, somebody's out to get you. That's not the case with Christianity. There's nobody who's out to get you. There's nobody who's trying to scam you. These are people who sincerely believe. I would agree. The overwhelming majority of them do sincerely believe. I certainly did. Doesn't change whether or not somebody's trying to convince you of something. We're all prone to exaggeration. I've watched people exaggerate what happened in church. I've heard people exaggerate their accounts of what happened with God. In the 14 plus years of doing the show, I could come up with countless examples if I went back and reviewed, but just the other day on the TV show, there was a guy who said, you know, hey, uh, my interactions with God in reality have borne out my assumption of God. And when asked about what those interactions with reality were, he went to dreams. Probably one of the worst things you could go to. There's a fundamental breakdown where people don't understand skepticism, the nature of evidence, they don't understand critical thinking, they don't understand why you should have high standards of evidence, because they begin with belief and work backward. That's one of the key things to address. It was one of the, the moments in this debate, which I'll remember for a long time. It's a great example. I was happy uh, that it happened because I shared it. Now, that doesn't mean Mike's an idiot. He's not. He's a bright guy. And to his credit, he recognized the problem with the lottery example. And hopefully, if he can get over the baggage of just, oh, I've had this experience and it must be God, and apply those standards of evidence to those questions, he might get to a point where he says, you know what, maybe I didn't have good reasons for my belief. And then he goes out and tries to find good reasons. And if he does and presents them, then guess what? I'm convinced and so is everybody else. But like the video I did last month where, it's always the resurrection where people are uh, accusing me of just being too dang skeptical. Your standards of evidence are too high. Yes, they're very high for extraordinary claims because they have to be. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.